Here we are. Hello, everybody. Finding Brave, welcome to it. And I hope you're having a wonderful week. You know I say this almost every time, but today I so mean it from the bottom of my toes. I'm so honored <laughs> and thrilled to have our guest, Nancy Duarte, here. What an honor. And you are so busy. And we're just about to get into the Thanksgiving holiday when we're recording this. I can't thank you enough for taking the time. Oh, I'm excited to spend time with you. Oh, Thanks for yes. having me. Oh, my pleasure. And I think I always love to tell folks how I first learned of my guest. I think we've connected, I think when I featured you in my Forbes blog, mm -hmm. I should have looked that up four years like, ago or so. Yeah. Yeah. At least that, at and, least that. And your body of work blew me away. Um, mm. So here we are four years later talking about your latest book, oh, Data Story, which is so fantastic. We're going to get into that. But everybody, let me tell you about Nancy, because you're going to fall off your chair like I did when I read this bio. Uh, Nancy Duarte is a communication expert who's been featured in Fortune, Time Magazine, Forbes, probably a lot of times in Forbes, Fast Company, Wired, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Co Cosmopolitan, and CNN. Her firm, Duarte Inc., is the global leader behind some of the most influential visual messages in business and culture. Yikes. And has created more than a quarter of a million presentations. As a persuasion expert, she cracked the code for effectively incorporating story patterns into business communications and is also a Harvard Business Review contributor. She's written, my God, six best-selling books. I'm, I'm just writing my second book and I give you so much credit. <laughs> six and have won, and won awards. Duarte Inc. is the largest design firm in Silicon Valley, as well as one of the top women-owned businesses yeah. in the area. Woo -hoo. You're Woo -hoo. on lists galore, and you're going to read all about that in, in the bio that I write up. But I do want to point everybody to your amazing TEDx talk, now, mm. now with more than 2 million views. And this one is the secret sauce, to, the secret structure, structure. to great uh -huh. talks. Uh -huh. I studied that. I studied it and found that's just so fascinating. That's so, so cool. Thank you. Thank you for all that you do for us. Oh, and thanks for having are, me. Oh, pleasure. So we're talking about data story, how to explain and present data uh -huh. and inspire action through story. So before we get into these wonderful questions, Nancy, can you tell me how you got into this work? What happened that compelled yeah. you to do this? Yeah. So there's like, my body of work is usually about the spoken word, you know, like I, we are kind of spoken word experts here, been around for 31 years, kind of putting the words in the mouths of powerful people. And then I think data has quickly become another whole other language, right? I mean, it is a number, a numeral, a, a number based language. And yet, yet we have all this data. And if you can't communicate your findings, you might as well not be commute, not be collecting the data. And so, um, we have our own, I mean, I was having my own internal frustrations. I'm only 120 people plus like 40 contractors. And we were wow. having our own issues with making decisions rapidly from data. And then I was having my uh, workshop attendees. They were saying like, we, we work with numbers all the time. We really want to, we really want to understand how to communicate our data. And so I just kind of dove in. I looked at, I have the privilege of working with the highest performing brands and the most powerful executives in the world. And I went in and I pulled all of the slides from our server that had data on them from the top seven performing brands we have. And I just, I looked at what chart did they choose and what language did they wrap it in? And that was the genesis for this book. So, yeah, so can I understand this. So you looked at the, your clients' presentations that mm -hmm. you helped them craft. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some with of them your about, expert presenter. Well, what's team. interesting is we did go to what they submitted. So sometimes, like they'll submit, and then we recraft and reshape. And so I, d I felt like oh. it would be biased, right? If I only use stuff that we had done. So it's I'd say it's half and half. Some was mm. what it said when it was brought in, and some was what it said when we sent it back. But yeah, I took I I I uh, it was fun. I pulled out all the words off the slides, like. What, what did wow. they use as adjectives? What did they use as, as verbs? What did they use as nouns? And, and just really pulled it all, all apart. And, and there's a great um, mm -hmm. couple of sections in the book where we talk about how to choose the right verb. Like after you've gone through the data, you found a problem or you found an opportunity in the data, what verb do you use to get people to take action so your data in the future changes? And so that, that was 
that was, wow. I think, one of my favorite parts of this whole thing was figuring out that. Oh, I, I, does this only have to be 30 minutes? What, oh, no. <laughs> I've got so many questions. And, you know, I, I, when you talk, when you speak, I didn't realize in the beginning then you were working on speeches for, for executives and, and high-level talks. Yeah. I don't think... I've always seen you as a person that are, that's dealing with data. And so I didn't really oh, yeah. realize that. Well, I think it's probably because a lot of my work is data. So the research I did for the TED Talk, that was like mm. data. I turned the spoken word into data. I see. And so uh, a lot of my work is, an, is analysis. And so I it see. is. So I would say you're right. I've worked with data all my life, but it's been um in, in my books, I portray a lot of the spoken word in, in a data form. Yeah. And, uh, you know, everything you say resonates as someone who writes on Forbes and, and my own blog, the headline, one word yeah. in the headline can make it go viral or have it get a thousand views, you yeah. know. Yeah. You're so right. And usually that ver uh, that word is a verb, you know. Uh -huh. Wow. But did I get the answer to how did you get into this from school, from high school? Oh, like early, early. Yeah. You oh, know, way I was early. always a math geek. I, you know, oh. I was in like Mu Alpha Theta Math Society <laughs> and in um in uh high school. And then when I when I went into college, I I took a speech communications course and I um, got a C minus in it. So I got an F in, <laughs> I got an A plus in the visual aids, right? I brought, you didn't have PowerPoint then. So I bought props, I would make posters. So I made an A on the visuals, but I actually got an F in bringing content to the table that was relevant to the students, right? And that was like a scarlet letter for me. I mean, I was just like, you that was like walking around with a big F. Yeah. And I think that failure, that, low empathy comes from it's kind of a long low empathy. tail but the my my low empathy in that situation was because i was actually raised in a home with a narcissist mom and a narcissist is missing the empathy gene so Nancy, i didn't have it modeled me. for me you no know, i teach and it's i was a pain. former therapist oh, and is I've that done right? webinar series oh and geez Louise. Nars, i had no idea yeah so that empathy gene was missing and especially young girls they need they need empathy modeled by their mom when they're forming, you know, in their formative mm -hmm. phase. And so I feel like all of my work, Slideology, Resonate, even the HBR Guide, the Illuminate and Data Story, it all has a thread of empathy because wow. so I, can, oh. I, can, I can hold a model in my mind and I can hold it there and be empathetic, right? And it, oh, wow. it, it's like this gateway for me to be empathetic. And I'm much more empathetic than I've ever been. Um, but that's kind of the, the genesis for all my body of work. So I, I answered the genesis I for data story. That. But yeah, well, if you must know then what I've gone I through. And I know. Yeah. I, it's, know it. I have yeah. a whole section in my upcoming book uh, about what narcissist, uh, narcissism does to us as we... Yeah. Good for you that you overcame it. Thank yeah, goodness not, for the end. Not everyone does. I know it, it like, shocked wow. me. And then it just made me super committed to, um, yeah, wow. I dropped out, dropped out of college too. After a year, I was so discouraged. Did you uh, go back or you didn't need to? You know what's interesting? I did, I, I, we popped down into the Bay Area built the business for 20 years, super successful business. And then Cisco, my customer, they put in a diverse supplier program, which is they try to help some of the diverse suppliers. They paid for me to get my MBA from UCLA. So because they represented me to UCLA because of my 20 years of business success, they let me skip my undergrad and I went straight into the uh, oh MBA gosh. program. So I have a high school degree and an MBA. Oh, wow. <laughs> but nothing in between. Perfectly right. Yeah. Oh my, that's so yeah. lovely. All right. Now let's get to the heart of this. And this is for anyone who pr basically presents anything to yeah. decision makers, to anyone that we're wanting to inspire some action from, whether right. it's, I was just mentioning, you know, the podcast episode I did where I reached a hundred episodes, I presented some data. There's, there's, we're not just talking when we're presenting data, we're wanting mm -hmm. some action or some decision. So right. what do we need to understand when what is communicating to decision makers look like 
in a way that's different from our normal conversation or the yeah. normal. If the decision maker is an executive, um, mm -hmm. I think there's a whole section in um, the book about communicating to executives. And I don't know if any other executives ever written a chapter on communicating to executives. About it's kind it. of like that movie Inception, I guess. <laughs> but um, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about when, where have I been frustrated when people communicated data to me? Why did I not know how to make a decision or why did I make the wrong decision? Mm -hmm. And so I thought through how I measure my own team and how I've been measured. And there's three ways that executives are measured and that's money, market, or exposure. That's it. So if you're writing a recommendation, you're trying to get action taken from data. If it doesn't hit a nerve on money, market, or exposure, it, the exec's not going to think it's worth their time. It's not mm -hmm. even worthy, really, to be on their, on their desk. So with money, an executive drives up revenue and profit, drives down cost. With market, they try to drive up market share, and they drive down time to market. With exposure, they're driving up retention, clients, employees, partners. They're driving the retention up, and they're driving the risk down. That's it. So if you go through data, you find a problem or opportunity that deals with any of those things, it should be on the table of an executive. And how you frame it inside of this framework is going to help them see it. Like for me, I was struggling to even just see, like I, I would be with an employee at the coffee pot and I would thinking they're just telling me color about their day and they're trying to get me to like make a decision. And so the nomenclature, there was a gap between when I thought they were asking for a decision versus they were just venting or they were just, you know, and so that's what, that's what a, a piece yeah. of this book is because if you're digging through data, you either found a problem or an, op or an opportunity and suddenly you're done looking at the data. Now you need to, use communication to solve the problem or the opportunity and that's a communication problem and so how and who you communicate with is just really critical at that point in time and a lot of people don't know how to communicate up they don't know they don't know a framework they don't know the empathy they don't understand what keeps an executive up at night and there's a whole section about that um, on on what keeps execs what's on their mind all the time and how they're measured. Can I just um, give an example of this and, yeah. and get your feedback? Yeah. One, one of the things that literally drove me out of corporate life, I, I was in a book club, big book club company for 11 years and another book club company bought us. Oh. Oh. And I did market research. I love data. And when customers said they don't like the negative option book club model where you just automatically send a book every month and they would have oh. to return it and no one would return it. Well, that's how our company made millions. Well, research, you know, huh. focus group after focus group said, I hate this. And so as the researcher, I said, <laughs> I made the mistake of presenting this as, and I went to the president and the CFO and the, you know, I have heard this now 100 straight times. Is there a way we could explore what the cost would be to do away with negative option and whatever, what it, holy one woman said to me, that was the nail in your coffin. And I was like, I didn't even know I was in a coffin. <laughs> but I think of what you're saying, mm -hmm. because while I had the data, the data wasn't fully baked enough in terms of the cost. I mean, they it imploded 10 years later. I was like yeah. 10 years ahead of you my You were time. early probably, right? right? You but saw you it don't coming. send an, an email to five of the top people with a half-baked data story. Right. Would right. you agree with that? Is exactly. that probably so what, what I did wrong? What's perfect about what you're talking about is a data story has a three act structure. The first one is you say you set the scene, like this is the situation. Right. The middle is what you had. You had your messy middle. This data is bad and we need to turn it around, right? This is the right. data that I'm concerned about. We right. need to change the trajectory of this data. And then the third act is where you're supposed to propose a solution. Therefore, we need to blah. Now, you might have said, therefore, we need to stop the program, but nobody's going to. So it could have been, therefore, while we are um, decreasing, while, while the um, uh, revenue in this model decreases because they're not happy with it, we need to invent a new model. And then if you had them crisscross and say, let's have, let's have carve out two people to be our innovation team and think about and research models in the future and where things are headed, then maybe, but you know, you're making me feel be better. You're healing 20 years of pain. <laughs> they didn't want that message any way I delivered it. 
Yeah, they they, they didn't want that message. Decay, right? Shut up. They, you're not on board. So now I, you've healed me. Thank you so much. <laughs> I appreciate it. Now, um, can you, can, let me just understand you, what you talk about in your 2 million TED talk. Mm-hmm. Do you think that that structure of a great talk, Martin Luther King, Lincoln, mm-hmm. does that still apply to the data story? You know, it does what the, um, the data story book itself is broken up into four chapters. The first three chapters are identifying the problem, make a recommendation. So it creates an initiative, you could call it that. The fourth chapter is, wow, you're so bright with data now, you're getting invited to be on a stage, whether it's an industry stage, an all hands meeting stage, um, uh, like your your people are wanting to hear from you as a communicator so the entire chapter four gets into crafting it so that you can verbally unveil it over time and there's all kinds i lifted some ideas from a couple of ted talks too and what's funny is i've been a student of steve jobs right i've transcribed every talk he's ever given and when i would analyze them for content i would be like oh that's content content oh that's data i'm going to skip over it oh content 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 oh data i'm going to skip over it there's no content like i used to think oh it's just data there's a finite way to present data and so when i was done with the whole book i was done with the data story concept i was done with the made to stick section which is kind of what you're talking about, uh, make data stick, I went to the transcripts that I keep right here in a drawer. And I went through and I highlighted everywhere he talked about data to see if my research was true. Because if it applies to Steve Jobs, it's true (laughs) almost, right? Your research about how to tell a compelling story and get action. Yeah. And so there's all kinds of other insights in the book around how you frame a, a, a moment. So The Resonate book is about the gap between what is and what could be as a structural device for the spoken word. What happens is you use data as a small atomic bit in this in this longer form right and so the way the way you frame that small atomic bite in a bigger narrative there's some real magic there and that's what the make data stick section is in here yeah oh my it was God. fun it was, gonna, it was fun i'm pouring over every word i mean every presentation i give is to insight yeah. breakthrough yeah. and mm-hmm. you, you know you need every aspect of communication to do that data yeah. emotion empathy yeah. wow yeah this is fun. I loved, oh, I loved so writing this exciting. book. Now, um, help us. Anybody listening who wants to present data to make an impact of some sort, how do you craft, as you call it, right, the data point of view? How do you do that? Yeah, I think there's a real um, career threshold someone crosses. So people who work in data all day, they're exploring it. They find things, they synthesize it, and they might see a problem. But a lot of people aren't comfortable forming a data point of view. So a point of view about data would be when you take the time to articulate the action, right? And whether it's whether they don't like the action or not is another thing, but you are seeing what is the action we need to take so our future data is different. And that's the big thing about a point of view, you know, Mm. kind of like your example, oh my God, the data is telling me we have a problem coming, right? And they just didn't believe you. Now, maybe if you shaped it slightly differently, that would have been more palatable, but I think you were hitting a nerve so deep. They never would have, I don't, you know, they never would have um, Mm. maybe bought off on it. But I mean, part of what um, taking a point of view about the data is, is your point of view will always have a verb. So it's like, "Uh uh-oh, I saw this in the data. Therefore, we need to what? And that's how you know your point of view should answer. Therefore, we need to what? And that's like, here's my point of view. Here's what's at stake if we do or do not do this action. And that's how you craft a point of view about the data. So it's, mm-hmm. it's not like a formula, which I think analytical people enjoy. Like if you take some of the creative nuance out of it, there's an actual formula that can craft for you an executive summary around your data of which the point of view is a part of it. Oh, um, so when you, well, I have so many questions. Um, what did you say that made me um, want to ask. I was talking so about the, the point data of view point and, of view. Mm-hmm. So is this, is this another way to say it? When you present, you have to, and, and the more you can sit in their shoes about what right. they're worried about, right? right? The more whatever you say is going to be received, mm-hmm. but the data point of view Tell me that again. Tell us that again. It has to have 
it has to have what is your point of view what meaning therefore we need to go do this activity and then what's at stake if people do or do not do that activity so you've Here moved into wow there's this big finding in the data so now we need to go do this now now having empathy for the people who have to do it is also a big part of it oh, but your really point true. of view is whoa i think we need to take this action this is what's going to happen if we do it this is what's going to happen if we don't and that is your point of view I, wonderful and you know this is what i wanted to hit on you said we the ultimate outcome is that we want to change this data i mean the if future there's a, data the, yeah it's it, so that takes it away from being personal. It takes it away from like this situation. Hey, look, we're going to lose money in 10 years. You don't think it's a problem, but this data is showing it. We need to change the data. It, yeah, it almost the future, data. the future data almost impersonalizes it. Is that yeah, what you're trying to get it does. at? It does quite a bit. And whatever, whatever the activity, so many people forget. I mean, we look at data. You, I mean, it sounds like you used to analyze data all day. We're just analyzing, analyzing, and people forget. Like we're, we're just kind of numb to the fact that humans pretty something. much generate it all of the data like pretty much you know if, if you personify a cancer cell or whatever that's also human in its nature and its activities right but i mean most of the data we track we're tracking what a human's done how many clicks did they do how much did they buy what what is their favorite of the like we're tracking human things so it is human activity and behavior that will change the trajectory of the data in the future and so that's the super important part because sometimes we just we, we get so sucked into the numbers and we're so excited by the numbers and, and what they say and what they mean that, that we forget that humans actually generated those numbers sometimes. And you are smart to have conversations or read the comments. And, you know, that's, that's the job of a good researcher. Wow. And, and, you know, I think what you're saying, if I push it further, is if I'm going to get up and present, um, the marketing data is pretty bad. We're losing our shirts. Anyone who's sitting in the, in the audience who had anything to do yeah. with the result that you're has just been attacked. Yeah. Right. So, and so that's why you have to have the answer to that. Like you can create suspense how you deliver it, but it's like, look, this, this data um, is headed the wrong way. So therefore now we all need to go do this new activity. So we turn the data around. Right. Can I ask you this? It's not a strict data question or data presentation. When I was doing market research, I was charged with researching another department's product development efforts. And the woman in charge who's passed away now had a fit. I mean, she was I like, bet. I want to get rid of Kathy. Um, what do you say w about when a, a person who's presenting data is actually not in charge of the initiatives <laughs> Like what I learned is half bake it and bake it up with her. In other yeah, words, don't ever that. present without her seeing it, without her being able to shape it. No. Would you agree? What, yeah, what I you agree with that? that. And I, one of the things I love about uh, some of the Google products and where the office products have gone is now you can go and, and co-create documents and co-create presentations together, even if you're in two different states or whatever. And so it's, it's becoming very cool, but collaboration, um, right. especially when it's between silos or between departments, that's a recipe for disaster if you don't have empathy, right? So that was kind of getting empathy. up and no, that was getting up and presenting something without having walked in her shoes first. And there's a, there's a lesser known, um, component of storytelling where the protagonist will put on the skin of sometimes their enemy or put on the skin of the very people they're in um, in a battle with avatar very clear right he put on blue and suddenly he's like this isn't our enemy right mm -hmm. and so it's this moment where you put on the skin of someone from another department walk in the shoes of someone from another department um, before you just walk into a room and present the content so that's an empathy um, that's an exercise in empathy i love this um, can you tell me something uh, you know you talk about steve jobs his stanford commencement speech i, I, love I can't get enough yeah. Are some people just naturally gifted orators and they never thought for a second how to, how to you know, streamline wow. a talk? You know, Steve uh, 
Mr. Steve Jobs worked for anywhere from six weeks to 12 weeks on his talks. So for his big ones where millions and millions of people, he would be served up to 2,000 slides, one to 2,000 slides. He would pick, he'd make them pixel perfect. He would, he would rehearse, rehearse. He knew what he wanted to say. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I struggle to believe. I mean, he didn't, there's no way he stood up and did that speech. He had notes in front of him. You can see him referencing them. So he planned. Now he may be faster at it. Um, but that's only from years when he actually there's some old um, footage of him uh, some kind of cutting room floor from some interview he did when he was just a wee pup like a little guy you know young was he great then no he was not mm. he was nervous he was he was I mean and wasn't super articulate you know I mean it's it and okay. and he was you know kind of airy you know just arrogant mm. and all that stuff and no I mean I he worked hard on um and and there's a big gap right i mean he was a really great communicator and it, it's really people ask me like who's the number one like maybe i ask you who's the number one business communicator today who people ask me that all the time i don't have any answers those shoes aren't filled it could be we should there should be some female some male that should be just as amazing of a communicator and there's a gap there's a gap so what i'm hoping that, nancy I don't know, right? But there's a big void there that can be filled. I think, you know, people are working on it. I mean, part of that is charisma. Part of that is... Part of it is. Energy. Yeah. Wow, yeah. whatever you've got going on, I want to listen. Yeah. I think we have a lot yeah. of that in our senior I agree. leadership. Especially All not right. in political leadership. Oh, Lord. There's another <laughs> Lordy, podcast. Lordy, we're not going to go there. <laughs> no, we're not. All right, now what if we not... Oh, two things. How do we make data stick and have we talked about the human a little bit you know we talked about that it can but i didn't really talk about how and okay. there's three things you can do to make it stick and one of them is to tie data to another relatable object so when you when when i've heard people say wow that that's as much money as if I were to stack the dollar bills, I could go to the moon and back and around it six times. And, well, how far is the, I've not been to the moon. Have you been to the moon? No, it's 269,000 miles. How far is 269,000 miles? Like the scale of that away. number. Yeah. Right. And so if you, if you, if you take numbers and, and make them relatable, like you would need to drive for four weeks at 65 miles an hour to get to the moon. Well, that's a little more, 24 hours a day, right? You can understand that because you know distance and you know okay. speed or you know, right? And so you have to connect it to something relatable for okay. people to get the scale of the number and attaching it that way. And another thing mm. is to talk about mm. the humans in the number. Like who is the person doing the struggle? And can you show a picture of them? Can you talk about a day in a life of this person who is creating this data? And and um, and make them relatable, and um, and then the other thing is using uh, time. Like you can actually show data over time. So it's interesting. You were talking about wow, the the numbers are going to crash, right? And um, I think you said, what if marketing has a bad number and it's just headed down? But you could you can tell charts over time to where they the numbers going down, but right here we we can change the data and we can make it go up. But if you show that over time, you can create the dramatic rise and fall of a story. So mm -hmm. you can create suspense and surprise just in showing a chart, just how you chose to break it over time and, and show it sequentially. So there's things like that that can get a gasp out of the audience. Instead of throwing all the data up there at once, you can actually get a, a, a gasp is a physical, emotional reaction to data. So you can create suspense and surprise. It's just It's just loaded with like, with ways to make it stick like that. Can I ask you to uh, dumb it down for us in that, okay, what am I trying to say? You know, when I give talks and now I'm talking about the seven damaging power gaps professional women wow. face and how we close them. Wow. And I presented it live for the first time in September with a few men in the audience, but mostly women. And it was the first time I said in front of people, I've done a survey now on its type form, so easy. 98% of all respondents have at least one of these gaps and over 75% have three or more. Wow. And there was a gasp. Yeah, I love that. Uh, um, so what I do want to say to people is it's not difficult anymore right. to get data. Right. But can you, I mean, I did it on type form, nice little easy, mm -hmm. easy um, survey that was, mm -hmm. you know, immediately showed me the data and I could download it and then cross tab mm -hmm. it and filters. But can you give us some, for somebody who is hearing you and saying, I know I need to talk about data, but I don't, I'm so uncomfortable with how to mm -hmm. do it 
where to get the what platforms. Do you have suggestions about yeah, easy I, accessible platforms? Um, that's a good question. I want to make a comment too, if you don't mind, on what you mm -hmm. just said, because I thought it was interesting. If you had um, if you had started your presentation and said ninety one percent have these. Um, power gaps and then you revealed the data I bet you didn't do it that way I, I bet you were going through the power gaps and they're like "Ooh, I don't want to be that per Ooh, I, I might have that right they're processing and then you said 91% and then they're like oh. so the order in which you did it so a lot nice. of people when they're presenting data they they are so excited about the 91% they didn't they didn't build over time all this underlying narrative and underlying data to where when they when they pop that 91% out there, it becomes a shocking statistic, we call it, and that's what you did. So that was that was good, but it was because you did it in a certain order. Right. You kind of flip the order. Um, for um, data, if, if you anyone in your audience is a data nerd, there's massive amounts of tools out there, um, Tableau, Excel, uh, just lots of, there's even a programming language called R that you make um, data in. But even day to day, like just, I mean, I think everyone uses Excel or even tables and PowerPoint or charts and and it's everywhere. It is everywhere. Like even my creative director, she's worked for me for 25 years now. Creative director does the most beautiful, you know, art directed the book. She, I mean, she's just beautiful. Yeah. And she's like, Nancy, I'm just fatigued. Data is every, like her job, about 20% of her job now, she's digging in data, optimizing the team. And it's just like, ah, so everyone, they say uh, right now, today, 67% of jobs are impacted by data, and that number's only going up. It's only going up. And so everybody's job now involves data, and how it's generated or how it's visualized is almost, you know, doesn't matter. It's just trivial. It's just that the data is there. If you, you can't feel communicate it, it's worthless, though. Do you feel people need to be good with numbers to be oh, good yeah. with data? Uh, no, I, I would either. say, I would I say either. just like, um, kind of to your question about are people natural communicators, mm -hmm. I think people are natural with numbers and I think some are not natural. I think that if you're not natural with numbers, you can learn it. Just like if you think you have no charisma, you don't have stage present, you can learn it. So I think it's, it's true. So someone charismatic might not have numbers. Someone who has numbers might not have charisma, but, uh, they're learned. They can be learned. Right. Oh, gosh, I love yeah. it. I love it. Now, what do we not know here? What What have we not <laughs> talked about that we, we would be remiss here? Other than my grandkids? Mm, <laughs> let me think. Um, You're amazing. Turkey. Oh, uh, turkey. Oh, yeah. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. I, um, I, I just... What do you I think really... the biggest thing that when you talk to a person mm -hmm. who doesn't know what you do, and they're, you know, working at an organization, important organization, and they're about to present data. What is the biggest, worst mistake they're making? No empathy, low empathy, not having considered the fact that I think it happens a lot with um, people that are in engineering or science um, backgrounds. They come at it and they'll just whatever is the normal, like let's say you're a cancer researcher, right? Well, you're using charts and scales of things that most people don't understand, right? And they forget that in their own industry, this is normal, but now I'm gonna to go to a big stage or I'm about to present to a broad audience. Like <sighs> if a cancer researcher, they can present to their peers differently, but if they're gonna go into a room with breast cancer survivors, you better not be, they won't understand all your logarithmic charts and your scientific data. So I think it's empathy. It's really, it goes all back to empathy. Know who you're talking to, know how they process information and really think through what you're asking of them and how they're going to feel about it. How are they going to feel when I mm -hmm. tell them that they need to behave this way or believe this thing or start you know, caring about something they didn't care about. And you got to map that out. We call it an audience journey. Who are they when they walked in the room? And who do I want them to be when they leave the room? And you have to articulate that. We call it a move from move to. We do that on every project we do from everyone. Everyone. All of my service business, my training business, it's like, here's who they are when they walk in the room. And here's who I want them to be when they leave the room. Everything you build in your talk should feed into that transformation of the audience. Oh. Right through. Can I um, give a, a palpable of how I blew that and so people can understand that? <laughs> yeah. So my world is people coming to me who aren't happy with their careers. So mm. if they're comfortable in that discomfort. And, and when I share that that was me, all is good. With this seven power gaps thing, which was new for me to present, 
one woman stood up and one of the gaps is acquiescing instead of saying stop to mistreatment. And she stood up and, you know, in front of 250 people, that's a big thing to stand up and say, I have to be honest, I've, I've never been in a job that I haven't been sexually harassed. Wow. And the whole audience gasps. And she said, is it your opinion that it is so prevalent that we need to grin and bear it? And I was so focused wow. on my message that I didn't wow. have this. I didn't have the empathy. I didn't have the audience journey in mind. And I said to her, you know, what's your name? Sarah. Sarah, no, it is. I'm so sorry that you've been through this. I, it breaks my heart. But no, it is not my view that we grin and bear it. Grin is smiling. Grin is saying it's okay. Bearing it is tolerating it. But I can be so forceful. No, I'm like that. that. I'm forceful. She, she wrote me later and said, wow. Um, I don't. She was hurt? I don't think you you were ready for my question because I think what she meant was you came at me hard. Oh, wow. Hmm. And I don't think other people felt that, but mm -hmm. I can be so into the message that I forget the impact of the person yeah. who's brave enough to stand there and say. Well, you live and breathe your work. It's based in research, right? And so right. for you, you come from a place of such great conviction. So probably the gap between your conviction about the truth of it and her not ever being able to take the stance that you're saying, right? right. Yeah. That's so I, I lost the empathy. I lost it. I lost the, con and you can lose an audience. Well, what do you wish you'd done differently? Oh, like what could you have said? Uh, so just softened it. I, oh. I could have said, I so hear you. I've experienced it. I think probably who in the room is normalized it. That's a therapeutic term, That's right? Normalized it. You are not alone, but let me share my view after all of this work that I've done. Yeah. I, but I, like you, probably, I get so fired up in the moment. Your heart's beating, right? You're pumping, you're fired up, you're trying to hold a stage and hold attention. It's hard to... I regret it. You know. I regret it. And empathy yeah, is the answer. Hard. Take a breath. All right. What, anything else to leave everyone with? Did we get to how to make data stick? Did we get to that? Uh -huh. We covered it all. <laughs> you know what I so recommend everybody? Get this book, Data Story, but also watch your TED Talk because I yeah. think they're a perfect complement. They are, yeah. Because there is an arc, as you said, if I had presented the numbers, okay, 98% and people would be like, big whoop. It's that you let them down a journey where there was empathy and they could relate first. Exactly. So watch this amazing. And where does everyone learn about you, Nancy? Where do they get uh, the book? How do they take all your amazing tools and That's what so they nice. Do? Um, we're at Duarte.com, D-U-A-R-T-E.com. I'm on Twitter, Nancy Duarte, Twitter at Duarte, Facebook. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, very active oh, on LinkedIn. Nice. Oh, awesome. So I do connect to everyone who connects to me on LinkedIn. And then, nice. yeah, I'm, I'm up there. Just Google it. <laughs> You'll probably Fantastic. find something of interest there. And the book, Amazon, wherever Amazon, books are sold, Amazon, Barnes right? & Noble. It's in all the airports. Um, I think it should be in all the airports through Ooh, like March. It's so chill. fun. Oh my gosh. We So my employees, you know, they're, they're they travel all around the world all the time. So they're sending pictures in. It's been fun. Yeah. Wow. Book's doing well. It's hitting a nerve. I'm so happy for you. Yeah, you are really, you. from a career perspective, you are, you know, you're, uh, you dug deep discovered your right work and illuminated the world with it. That's what I think you've done. And that's so, sweet. so inspiring, Nancy. Thank you for being here. Come back again with your next book, number seven, <laughs> right? God yeah, darn so it. Oh, oh, congratulations. That's, thank you. I hope you're so inspired. If you don't have questions, we're not doing our job. Ask us questions. Connect with Nancy on LinkedIn. Yeah. You know, ask your question. I'm going to post this wherever I am, all the social media. Ask your questions. I'm sure we've cracked open something for you that you don't quite understand. We'd love to hear from you. And I'm guessing Nancy might have the time to answer a question or yes, two. Maybe. I do. I do. Wonderful. Thank you again, everybody. You. Have a wonderful, brave week. We so appreciate you being here. Yeah. See you next time. Bye, Nancy. Bye-bye.